Amen. All right, friends, we're here, and we're going through this new series entitled uh, Marriage Reconciliation to the Sanctuary. And what's our theme for today, Hillary? Well, for this evening, we will be looking at seal closing and sealing the sacred circle. That's very, very important. Closing and sealing the sacred circle. Now, what marriages are in a crisis, as we have covered on last week? Well, of course, we know the marriage relationship between husbands and wives are in a dire crisis, as well as our, our personal relationship with Jesus Christ is also in a crisis due to lack of conversion. And we discovered that it is Satan's plan to destroy God's twin institutions, marriage and the Sabbath. Correct. And we also discovered that whenever individuals are going through marital problems, serious crises in their marriages, that many times they cannot receive or they don't have the peace the Sabbath brings. So truly, it is Satan's plan to destroy God's twin institution, marriage on the Sabbath, as we see here in the book Adventist Home, page 340. And also, it is Satan's plan, as we read in Adventist Home, page 15. Hillary? Society is composed of families, and it is what the heads of families make it. Mm. Out of the heart are the issues of life, and the heart of the community, of the church, and of the nation is the household. So, so as we're seeing here, what, what the devil's plan is, but also God has a plan. And the plan that God has for the individual to be reconciled to himself is the same plan the Lord has for the married couple to be reconciled to each other. Amen. And we know where do we find God's plan to reconcile the individual, to reconcile the couple back to him? Well, of course we find it in the sanctuary. And we know what Exodus 25 says 25 verse 8 Correct. says, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So he wants individually to separate sin from our lives so that we may dwell with him. And he wants for couples to separate sin out of their marriages mm. so he may dwell among their relationship. And we also see last week when we covered this in Psalm 77 and verse number 13 where the Bible says, Thy way, O Lord, underscoring thy way. Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. Amen. Who is uh, so great to God as our God? God's way is in the sanctuary. Amen. And that way is to eradicate sin from our lives that we may be reconciled with him. That way is to remove sins from the heart of husband and wife so they too can be reconciled with each other. And we saw that when we say God's way is in the sanctuary, it simply means that we must be willing to surrender our, our way. Own way. Amen. Accept God's way and God's way in his time. Surrender our will as married couples and accept God's will and accept God's will in his own time. Amen. Now notice, as we cover this, Look at the statement here from the book Adventist Home, page 100, showing us this principle that in order for a single individual to be reconciled with God, that person must surrender sins in his life. Yes. Likewise, for husband and wife to be reconciled to each other, there is surrendering of sins that must take place in both hearts because unless both husband and wife are reconciled to God individually. They will never be reconciled to God collectively. Look at this statement here, Adventist Home, page 100. First, it says, like every other one of God's good gifts, entrusted to the keeping of humanity, marriage has been perverted by sin. But it is the purpose of the gospel to restore its purity and beauty. So when marriages are broken, what, what is the only thing that can fix 
these broken marriages. It's the gospel. The gospel. Thy way, O Lord, is in the... Is in the sanctuary. It's the gospel. That's right. And that's why we cannot seek for any type of reconciliation from individuals that are not teaching the gospel from the word of God. Correct. So that throws out the window. Worldly counselors, Correct. psychologists, the list goes on and on. Self-help, even looking within to solve the problems. You have to go to the gospel. And this is what the next statement is really saying. Adventist Home, page 179. And for those of you who are taking notes, write down this quotation from Ministry of Healing, page 363. It goes in line with that statement we just read, that marriage has been perverted by sin, but it is the purpose of the gospel to restore its purity and beauty. Ministry of Healing, Page 363 says that the gospel it's the, is the wonderful simplifier of life's problems. Amen. Let's take the statement. Adventist Home, page 179. The cause of division and discord in families and in the church is separation from Christ. Mm. To come near to Christ is to come near to one another. The secret of true unity in the church and in the family is not diplomacy, not mm, management, no. not a superhuman effort to overcome difficulties, though there will be much of this to do, but union with Christ. Notice now, but what now? Union, union with, with Christ. Christ. Look at the statement here on the screen, Ad Adventist Home, page 179. We are told, picture a large circle from the edge of which are many lines, all running to the center. The nearer these lines approach the center, the nearer they are to one another. Amen. In other words, Christ must be that center yes. of that circle, right? As our, our theme says, closing and sealing the sacred circle. circle. Who must be at the center of that sacred circle? Jesus Christ. And the closer individuals, husband and wife, come to Christ, that, that center, that nucleus, right? The closer they are together. Amen. Likewise, contrarily, as far away as the husband and the wife are from Christ the center, so far are they away from each other. So that means basically if your marriage relationship is not founded on Christ and each spouse, husband and wife does not have his or her own personal relationship with Christ, then you can expect alienation Correct. and division because they are not close to each other. And here is the illustration. Look at the four lines in the one circle, the sacred circle, right? Hillary, read that line again on the right hand of that screen. Picture a large circle from the edge of which are many lines all running to the center. Mm -hmm. The nearer these lines approach the center, the nearer they are to one another. And notice the lines that are running horizontally, east to west, those yellow lines. Notice Christ is at the center. The closer the wife and the husband are to the center Christ, the closer they are to each other. Look at the lines running vertically, north to west, north to south. Do you see it now? Yes. The farther away those lines are from the center, the farther away they are from each other. That's right. And this illustration brings something to mind right now. As I'm looking at the horizontal lines, the husband and the wife, mm -hmm. of course, we are to be in Christ. So as we're submerged in Christ, then, of course, the ideal would be that we are one because we're both in Christ. So that means it's no longer two separate lines, Correct. although there is individuality, which Correct. we'll get to later in yes. the series. But the two are indeed one in and, Christ. Amen. And as we look at the sanctuary, we realize the steps the individual must take to be reconciled with Christ are the same steps husband and wife must take to be reconciled with each other. Why? Matthew 19, verse 5 and verse 6, which simply says, The two become one. Become one. And this is part two of our series now. Part two, right? Yes. In part one, we show the individuals, husband and wife, that when you have serious problems in your marriage, where are they in relation to the sanctuary? Where are they? 
They're outside of the gate. They're on the outside. Mm -hmm. On the outside. And what is God's ideal? Where does God want the individual to meet him as well as the married couple to meet him? Where? In the most holy place because that's where his presence is. And what text we gave you? Hebrews chapter 10, mm -hmm. verse 19 through verse 22. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 16. But now, we must move to the second step now, right? Yes. Which is showing the husband and wife in part two of their marriage counseling session where they are. They are no longer in the... Outside of the gate. Outside the gate. Mm -hmm. Now they're in the courtyard. Yes. On the inside. And before we begin uh, line, uh, part number two, we gave uh, them some homework. And normally when we do marriage counseling, we don't allow the sessions to have too many days in between. So we can keep the sessions as close to each other as possible. Not trying to get three days in between, but right. a day or two mm -hmm. and come right back. So then we can show them through the illustration that they're no longer on the outside of the gate, the sanctuary, but now they're in the courtyard. They ministered with the lamb, as you can see, bottom right off your screen. They also found themselves on the altar of sacrifice. And then we gave them a homework. What was that homework? that we gave them last week? Hillary. Well, firstly, we told them that they were to go over their notes. Correct. We also told them that they were to reestablish or establish family worship in the home, that husband and wife were to pray together at least three times per day. Correct. And as they prayed and prayed three times a day, that they were to claim specific promises, right? Yes. About how God has the power to reconcile them to himself and to reconcile both husband and wife together. And we gave them a particular passage of scripture to read daily. What was that passage? That was 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the whole chapter. Read that scripture, right? Yes. And pray. Notice now, why is that homework so important? That's well, the question. Well, there was why? one more thing we told them not to do okay, as a discuss. form of her homework. Yes. They were not to discuss any uh, marital issues at all. And they were to wait until those, those are dealt with in the sessions. Correct. In, because once they initiate the process of having the pastor, the third party, the objective spiritual person to be that mediator to help them to be reconciled, then they are to wait until they get to that session where those issues are now dealt with. All right? Very, very important now. Mm -hmm. And if they refuse to do the homework, then we send them back home and the session ends. Why is it so important for them to do the daily homework, the homework on a daily basis? Why, why, why daily? Well, we gave a specific text in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31, where the Apostle Paul says, I die daily. So it's a daily process that they have to go through. And, and secondly, the work in the courtyard based on the sanctuary was not done monthly or Yearly. by, you know, <laughs> twice a year. It was done every single day. Right. Dying daily. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 12, a daily work. Hebrews 10 and verse number 11. Hebrews 7 and verse 27. It has to be a daily work. That's Luke right. 9, verse 23. If you're coming after me, deny yourself. And take up your cross how often? Daily. It's a daily experience. Notice right. now, if, if the individual does not surrender to God daily, what would happen to his sins when Christ or the high priest cleansed, cleansed the sanctuary? Well, his sins would not be blotted out. His sins, his or her sins Correct. would remain with the sinner. And this is why the husband and wife must do the homework right. and must do it daily. Now, if they, if they did the homework, then they can advance from there. Let's get to the sanctuary. So now they are advancing. The lamb is slain, right? Mm -hmm. And the blood is caught, right? Right. Given to the priest. So now by faith, the sinner who is now uh, repentant must watch what two things? They must watch the blood and they must watch the priest. Exactly. As he ministers. Exactly. So okay. now, once the priest ministers at the lamb, on the screen, bottom right corner, ministers at the altar, 
Where is the next ministration in the courtyard? It's at the laver. At the laver. So that's where we are today, at the laver. So now here is where I draw, because many times I don't have a diagram in the office. I may draw, scribble on a paper, and turn that paper to husband and wife, that they can see exactly where they are in part two of this marriage counseling. Marriage reconciliation through the? The sanctuary. They're at the laver. The priest goes to the laver. Yes. Follow the priest, the blood, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's go to the book of Exodus. And let's see what material was used to make that laver. Mm -hmm. Exodus chapter 30, and read verse 18 for us, Hillary. Let's see what material was used to make that laver. Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, mm -hmm. and his foot also of brass, to wash with all. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and All the right. altar, and thou shalt put water therein. So now, so what material was used to construct, erect this laver? Brass. Brass. And where did they receive the brass from to erect the laver? They received it from the looking glasses of the women. I want to read that. Go there. Exodus chapter 38. Look at verse number 8. Very, very important. And I'm sharing these scriptures now because they must understand where they are in the sanctuary, verse 8. And he made the laver of brass mm. and the foot of it of brass of the looking glasses of the women, assembling which assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So this is a looking glass. Mm -hmm. So the looking glasses were collected and melted and, and used to prepare the laver. All right now? So now what in the Bible is likened onto the looking glass? And this is where I begin to show them what that labor means to them as a married couple. Mm. So in the Bible, the looking glass typifies the law of God. It's the mirror. James chapter 1, verse 23 through verse 25. It's the law of God. And the Bible says in James chapter 1, when you look in that mirror, look in that glass, and you see deficiencies and defects in your life, you must not walk away without desiring a change, right. a fix, a cleansing. That's right. And so the labor now, it's a mirror showing a husband and wife the crisis, the crises, the issues in their marriage. And they must not act as if there's nothing wrong in their marriage. Right. They must see that there is a need now, a great need for a change. That's right. And they must see also that those issues in the marriage it are what breaks God's law as well. And breaks God's heart. heart. So what was placed in that laver? Water. Water. Let's go back and read that. Chapter 30 of Exodus. And what was the purpose of the water? Because this point is very, very important. And normally when I come to the second session in the marriage reconciliation through God's sanctuary, I have in the office there a basin. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see what that basin is for. All right? It's the labor. Right. It's the labor. Very, very important. Let's read that. Chapter 30 of Exodus and verse 18, verse 19, go to verse 21. So verse 18 says the water is placed in that in labor, labor, right? Mm -hmm. Let's read verse 19 now. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. Now, some folks may say, well, I'm not Aaron, mm -hmm. but it's the work of the priest. So right here, I give them 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, showing that the work of the priest of past times, in a secondary sense, is the experience of God's royal priesthood, God's holy people, God's peculiar, peculiar people. people. Mm -hmm. Make sense now? Yes. All right. Let's read now. So they were to wash their hands mm -hmm. and wash their feet, right? Yes. I wonder why. What, what if they refused to wash hands and feet? Well, they're basically saying that they have no need, that they are they're fine. Exactly. They forget what manner of person they were after looking in that glass, looking in that law. And before you read that, look at the screen. Here you find the laver. The laver is right there in the middle. The middle of what two things, Hillary? The laver. Uh, the altar of sacrifice, the and brazen altar, and also the holy place, the tent, exactly. the tabernacle. So unless the individual experiences the washing, he cannot enter into the tabernacle. 
Wow. And unless husband and wife receive the experience at the labor, they cannot enter the, the tabernacle by faith. Mm -hmm. And where does God want them to meet him? In the most, most holy, holy place. place. Let's read that now. Verse number 20 and verse 21 of chapter 30 of Exodus. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, yes. they shall wash with water mm -hmm. that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generation. Now, this labor, put this down, this labor typifies two things. One, baptism for the individual. And there may be cases where the husband and wife need to be rebaptized. Now, one quick qualification. This lesson is not just for any anybody. Right. The married couple have to be desirous for change and to be reconciled with God and with each other. Through his way. Sin. Amen. So now, baptism. And there may be things, especially if there was adultery in the marriage and both want to be reconciled. We get to that later on, right? Baptism. Now, let's say the issue does not require literal baptism. Mm -hmm. The second thing, the labor now typifies the ordinance of humility. What is that? The foot washing. Foot washing. Mm -hmm. foot washing. And this, go to John 13. And this is where now I share with the husband and wife that this is where both of you need to wash each other's feet. Amen. And in the process of husband first washing the wife's feet, like Christ, first watch, washing the disciples' feet, he must be like Christ. Right. Make sense now? Mm -hmm. And as he washes the wife's feet, his hands are being washed. Amen. And then as she washes his feet, her hands are being, are being washed. washed. And this is a symbol of what washing? A, wash, a total washing, a washing of the whole body. And soul we, and spirit. Let's read that now. Verse 6. And we all know, know the story of John 13, right? Verse 6 through verse number 11, right? John mm -hmm. 13, yes. 6 through verse 11. You want to read that? 5 through 11. We can read 6. All right. What it says there. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, mm -hmm. and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Correct. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Hmm. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not to save, I'm sorry, needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. What verse is that? Verse 10? Uh, yes, that Go was to verse 10. 11. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Now notice, there has been communion service held at various churches where husband and wife may have washed each other's feet. And yet there are still crises in their marriages, right? Right. So notice now, there is a possibility that we can do the right thing, but do it at the wrong time. Do the right thing, but not with the right understanding. Or motive. It's out of context. Mm -hmm. So in this experience now, once you have done the experience in part one, then part two makes more sense while you're doing this. Correct. And this foot washing, it also removes alienation from the heart. It brings about unification in the heart. Mm -hmm. Look at this statement here. The Desire of Ages, page 646. The red word says, Peter says, he could not endure, that's Peter, he could not endure the thought of what, Hillary? Of separation from Christ. That would have been death to him. So this foot washing was to remove separation and do what? And bring Re about unity. Reconciliation. All right, mm -hmm. blue words. Christ desired by that very act to wash the what? Three things. Alienation, jealousy, and pride from their hearts. And in many marriages, is there alienation? Yes. Is there pride? Yes. All right. Watch carefully. Red words. With the spirit then 
with the spirit they then had. Not one of them was prepared for communion with Christ. Wow. So when you put it in the right context now, if this foot washing is not done now, neither of you is prepared to have what? Communion, communion. with Christ. Very, very important And you're not now. able to enter into that tabernacle. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. The two mm -hmm. become one. one. Back to the screen. Blue words. Their heart must be cleansed. Pride and self-seeking create dissension and hatred, but all this Jesus washed away in washing their feet. And if they refuse to be washed, this ordinance of humility, then we can end the marriage session, counseling session right there and then. They can go home. They're wasting God's time. They have to follow God's way through weird. The, the sanctuary. sanctuary. And just imagine if they do refuse, they have to walk past the experience that they just had in session one. So it's like you're turning your back now on God's presence because God's presence is going to the most holy place. You're turning your back on that experience. You're turning your back on the labor experience. Also the altar of, of burnt sacrifice and walking outside the gate. Did Judas have his feet washed? Yes, he did. Yet what happened, what happened in the heart of Judas? He grieved away the Holy Spirit. So in other words, if the husband and the wife aren't careful, they would do even this important event, experience, just out of a form. Hmm. And uh, they will grieve the Spirit of God, wow. like Judas, and another spirit will possess their hearts. Get to the screen, red mm -hmm. words at the bottom, looking upon them. Looking upon them, Jesus could say, ye are clean. Now there was union of heart, love for one another. They had become humble and teachable. Mm. Hold on, they have become what now? Humble and teachable. I'll come back to that. Last sentence, except Judas. Judas. Let's leave that one alone. So once they go through the ordinance of humility, what did Christ declare the disciples? They were now humble and teachable. And that ye are all clean. clean. Three things right there. So mm -hmm. it's at this point, God now declares husband and wife how? Clean. Clean. And in what condition are their hearts and minds? Humble. humble and teachable. Because this is the next step now. Right. And what I see many times with counseling, marital counseling sessions, the minister, the elder, the third objective person does not prepare the heart of husband and wife to become a humble and teachable. Mm. That's it. Mm -hmm. It's God's way now. It's God's way. Amen. Now, at this labor, a third thing, at this labor, not only is it baptism mm -hmm. and the ordinance of humility foot washing, it's also the renewal of your covenant with God. It's baptism, right? Right. Rebaptism, right? Mm -hmm. Put down, put down testimonies, volume six, page 91, paragraph one, and page 98, and also paragraph three. 91 paragraph 1, 98 paragraph 3. This ordinance of humility, the Lord's Supper, the foot washing, it is the renewal of vows for the individual. So what is the application then for husband and wife at this stage of their walk in the sanctuary? That they must now renew their vows one That's to it. another. That's it. This is where husband and wife renew their wedding marriage vows. It's right here. It's right here. Mm -hmm. Look at this statement right here. Adventist Home, page 103. Hillary? Men and women at the beginning of married life should reconsecrate themselves to God. So before they get married, what must they do? Reconsecrate themselves to God. Now, re re rarely do I do marriage counseling because some people, they set the date they go ahead and they order wedding gowns and uh, the clothes for the groom. They bake the cake already, put in the freezer, cook the food, put in the freezer, right? And then they come to the pastor. Now, pastor, my wife-to-be or husband-to-be, we want marriage counseling. But they already set the date. What, can, what counseling do they need? No, 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 they want tips, not counseling. Peradventure in that counseling session, 
God reveals that both of you should not be united in marriage. What would they do at that time? You see? Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. rarely that takes place. But the point here is that before marriage, what must happen? A reconsecration to God. They must walk through the sanctuary. That's right. And when they have marriage, count, marriage issues, what must they do? Retrace their, their steps, steps through the sanctuary again. That's right. Return to their first love, as it were. And when you think about it, God wants to make us new creatures. And so the old things are passed away. So it's like you're starting anew. Once you do that ordinance of humility, you wash away the past issues, Sit. as it were, and you're, re -be or you're beginning again. And so that's why you need to reconsecrate, create yourself to God and renew your vows that's to it. each other. Right there at the laver. The laver. Do you see it now? Yes. And of course, the laver is a mirror. Mm -hmm. It's a mirror. Recommitment of vows. It says on page 178, let fathers and mothers make a what, Hillary? A solemn promise to God. Whom they profess to love and obey, that by his grace. Praise God. Not in your strength now. Not your way. That's it. Amen. That by his grace, they will not disagree between themselves, hmm. but will in their own life and temper manifest the spirit that they wish their children to cherish. So what do they pledge to do? At the labor by God's grace? That they will not disagree, disagree between themselves. Mm. Important. 105, third paragraph. To gain a proper understanding of the marriage relation is the work of a lifetime. Those who marry enter a school from which they are never in this life to be graduated. So in other words, because some may say, but pastor, when we renew the marriage vows at the labor, right? we still have issues to deal with. Mm -hmm. Look at it from a individual perspective. When we come to Christ and we get baptized, at that point we are justified. Are we not justified? Amen. Does that mean we have reached the full stature in Christ? No. Does that mean we are perfected? Not at all. Does that mean we have overcome every temptation? No. no. We are growing. Correct. And the just man may fall seven times, but he gets back up until he reaches that very standard of perfection. That's right. So in the marriage, when we say by God's grace, we do, it doesn't mean we won't have problems. As a matter of fact, I have not seen some of your defects and your shortcomings. You haven't seen my failures. My skeletons in the closet. And right? sometimes. So now it's a growing process. That's right. So even though we have the vows, we make the vows, it doesn't mean that's the end. No. What we are saying is, as a couple, whatever comes our way is how we respond, respond to, to it. it. Right. It's how we respond to it. Go ahead, Hillary. I was just going to say, and sometimes we don't even see certain defects in our own characters until we begin to live with a, another person. Yes. You know, maybe we lived on our own for a period of time, but until somebody else comes in the home, you see really how selfish you are. Then the children come along, and you, then you see, find out other things about yourself that you didn't know were there. Defects I'm talking about. Correct. So there's always going to be things that come up. Correct. But it's the way you that's, deal with it. And thank you, Hillary. And that's why in part one of the session, we did not deal with any issues, just the heart and how we deal with each other, not so much the intricate details. Right. Right? She burned the beans, right? No, 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 no. It's how, because, so what if she burnt the beans? Right. Do you see it now, friends? Yes. You see? Are we long suffering? Yes, right? and yes. So, it, so that's why part one was so important. But in part two, we will get to some issues. Go ahead. Hannah. Right. I was just going to say as well, the sanctuary is teaching us also that at every stage there has to be self-examination. Correct. Because when you walked in, Land. you realized there was a problem. That's what brought you, drew you to the sanctuary. Then you got to the altar where confession was made. So you're examining yourself there. You go to the labor, you're looking in that mirror, looking in the law, seeing how you've transgressed the law of God. So there's self-examination there. At every stage there has to be self-examination and there has to be examination of the marital relationship. And just as, as the individual walk with God, being reconciled with God, to God, right, is the work of a lifetime. A lifetime. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. lifetime. Likewise in the marriage, husband and wife 
it says it's a school from which they are never in this life to be graduated. Wow. Look at this potent scripture. Quotation, Adventist home, 105 paragraph 2, the fourth paragraph. However carefully and wisely marriage may have been entered into. Few. Few couples are completely united when the marriage ceremony is performed. Mm. The real union of the two in wedlock is the work of the after years. So now, so once they experience the labor and they're willing to go through the ordinance of humility, they go through the renewal of the vows, and I would sit with them in the office, even at their homes, and go through the wedding vows, renewing their covenant with God. Mm -hmm. Once they get through this part of it now, then we go to the next step. We advance following the lamb, the blood of the lamb, and we're following the priest. Once the priest now ministers at the labor, where does he go next? Well, he moves now from the outer court to the holy place inside the tabernacle. And once he gets inside the tabernacle, where does the first ministration take place? At the table of showbread. Go to Leviticus chapter 4. Leviticus chapter 4, and we are going to reference that scripture. I'll give you another scripture for reference that once the priest ministers in the holy place, the next place he goes to is the holy place. Out of court, holy place. Courtyard, holy place. Leviticus chapter 4, write this down, verse 4 through verse number 7. And the second scripture is Hebrews chapter 10, and verse number 12 is in the holy place. And then the work is done at the table of showbread right there. Look at the screen. At the bottom right of your corner, the priest is in the holy place. You have the table of? Of showbread. How many loaves are there? Twelve loaves. Let's read that for a very important reason. Go to Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24 and verse 5. All right. I'm just going to reference that. Verse 5. Uh, speaks about 12 of, uh, loaves of bread. I wonder why 12 Five loaves. Five and six. Five and six. I wonder why, why 12 loaves. Well, because we need, need to see what the Word of God has to say on various issues. That's it. Numerous issues. So folks were asking, Pastor, but how did you end session one? And we didn't address these intricate details in the sanctuary. Where are the issues dealt with? At the table of showbread. Showbread. What does the bread represent well, and who? Firstly, well, the who would be it represents Christ. That's I it. am the bread of life. We see that all throughout John 6. John 6, verse 48. Mm -hmm. And we know the what would be the word of God. That's it. Matthew 4, verse 4, right? Right. Let's read this scripture, though. Uh, this scripture, though. Go to 2 Timothy. I want this one. 2 Timothy. The loaves, the 12 loaves typify God's word. Christ, mm -hmm. God's word. In 2 Timothy, this is a text... I want husband and wife to highlight, to circle, to asterisk beside it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, verse 17. Verse 16 says, For all scripture are given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in what, Hillary? Finish it. Uh, in righteousness. For what purpose now? So that? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So let's take the man out now. So all scripture is given by God. For what purpose? Doctrine. For doctrine? Mm -hmm. For what now? Reproof. So pause right there. So maybe now there are issues in the marriage. The marriage may be broken because of doctrinal issues. Unequally yoked. Do you see no mm -hmm. friends? It's in the holy place. These things are dealt with. What's the next one? Reproof. Yes. Somebody in this marriage union needs what? Reproof. Reproof. One it's or done both. where? Holy table place. Next bread. point? Correction. Somebody are, and both need? Correction. correction. Instruction. Next? In, instruction. In righteousness. And what is righteousness? It's right. Right doing. doing. Where is mm -hmm. it found? In the holy place. By the bread. God's way, not man's way. That's right. And that's why I used to counsel people, okay, they walk in. What's the problem? You mean you, you walk out from, you left the, from outside the gate and jumped right into the <laughs> holy place? 
You're a thief and a no robber. No wonder <laughs> many times those counseling sessions aren't effectual. Mm -hmm. Do you see it now? Mm -hmm. It's not God's way. It's man's way. Right. And then it says in verse number 17, that the man of God or that the married couple mm -hmm. may be what? Perfect. Perfect. That's it. Perfect. Amen. Truly furnished, furnished unto what now? Unto all, all good, good works. works. It's right here, my friends. And I think complementary to that would be um, Hebrews 4.12, I believe, that the word of God is yes. quick and powerful yes. and sharper than a two-edged sword, um, dividing asunder. asunder, even to the bones and the marrow. I'm and paraphrasing. Is a discerner That's where I'm in, going, of the, of the, of the thoughts and the intents of the, of the heart. heart. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it, friends. The word of God, right? Yes. Amen. And what's, what's interesting, too, is that the showbread is always there. There's never a time when the table is empty. Correct. Every week it had to be replaced, but there was never a time where there was no, no bread on the table. Correct. So that means whatever the issue may be, the bread has to be, be there. That has to be the counsel, the counselor, Amen. the reprover, the corrector, the, the instructor. Go back to 1 Corinthians 13, Hillary, and let's make this plain to the people now. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 13. This is why 1 Corinthians 13 was in session number one, right? Mm -hmm. And also their homework. What's in verse, verse, verse three? And though I bestow all my goods uh -huh. to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Verse four. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Is not. Is not puffed up. All right. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily, easily provoked. Provo so now, as Thinketh you're no going evil. through the 12 loaves now, different issues in the marriage. If one party, if one spouse, if his or her sin is exposed now, how must the other respond? Well, long-suffering. Exactly. Right. Makes it's not now? easily provoked. That's why part one was so important. Mm -hmm. So now, what is one of those issues? That's it. What is one of those issues, one of those loaves of bread that will give us doctrine, that will give us reproof, that will give us uh, correction and instruction in righteousness, right doing? Mm -hmm. What must we do? Well, we must establish or reestablish the sacred circle. Oh, Hillary. One more time. What? We must establish or reestablish the sacred circle. Sacred circle. Let's read that. There is Adventist a, homepage 177. There is a sacred circle around every family which, which should be preserved. Mm -hmm. No other one has any right in that sacred circle. The husband and wife should be all to each other. Pause. I want everyone to pay attention attention all right the husband and the wife should be all to each other mm -hmm. the wife should have no secrets on the to keep that. from her husband no secrets and let others know mm. and the husband should have no secrets to keep from his wife to relate to others the heart of his wife should be the grave for the faults of the husband and the heart of the husband the grave for his wife's faults Never should either party indulge in a joke at the expense of the other's mm. feelings. Never should either the husband or wife, in sport or in any other manner, complain of each other to others mm. for frequently indulging in this foolish and what may seem perfectly harmless joking will end in trial with each other and perhaps estrangement. estrangement. All right. I've been shown that there should be a circle I'm sorry, a sacred shield around every family. And notice now, a, a, a what shield? A sacred shield. It says the home circle should be regarded as a sacred place, a symbol of heaven, a mirror. Where are we now in the sanctuary? Well, in the most... Laver. Yeah, the laver Laver. Mm -hmm. See, the mirror, the laver. And then we go to the bread, to the right? Place, yes. So the home circle should be regarded as a sacred place, a symbol of heaven, a mirror in which to reflect ourselves. Friends and acquaintances we may have, but in the home life, they are not to meddle. Last Amen. sentence. A strong sense of proprietorship should be felt, giving a sense of ease, restfulness, trust. 
Can I just emphasize something real quick in that last statement? The yes. first line of that last statement says that um, the sacred circle should be a symbol of heaven. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know that um, Christ is one with his father. I think we gave that text last our, our last session. And so in heaven, Christ and his father were in this sacred circle as Correct. it was. Mm -hmm. And nobody else could enter into those councils. And that's what uh, aroused the jealousy of Satan. Even right. though there were angels around and there were other heavenly beings in that sacred circle, it was just um, God, Christ and his father. Mm -hmm. And so it is in the sacred circle that God has established. It is, well, it's really Jesus <laughs> along with husband and wife, but nobody else can enter into Correct. that council Correct. or should be allowed in there. Correct. Now, notice that last sentence, a strong sense of what? Proprietorship. What, what does that mean? Should be felt, giving a sense of ease, restfulness, and trust. This is going to be a side note. Husband and wife should never allow the other spouse to doubt his or her love. Never. Don't forget that. Never. A strong sense of proprietorship should be felt. Make sense now? Mm -hmm. Giving a sense to husband and wife, ease, restfulness, and trust. A sacred circle. Right. They now, should cherish that circle. Guard it. Look at the screen right here. This sacred circle can be seen in the sanctuary message. Hmm. Watch carefully. Once that high priest, on the screen right here, what you're seeing is a laver mm -hmm. or an illustration of the laver, and then... Beyond the laver, you're seeing now the door to go into the tent. Holy place, most holy place. I want everyone to watch this. Once the priest, a different picture, once the priest goes to the sanctuary, look right here. Once the priest leaves the laver, he goes where next? To, to the, the holy tent. Holy place, right. Holy place. Mm -hmm. And he closes that curtain. Wow. So the people on the outside cannot see where? Inside. Cannot see. Why? A sacred circle. It's closed. That's the Bible telling us something here. Mm -hmm. And the sinner on the outside had to look by faith inside there. Make sense now? Mm -hmm. And what's happening here, husband and wife, they have opened that curtain. Right. Opened that door. And they're letting other people in. Like whom? Look at it right here now. Here is the illustration now. There it is. Now, Hillary, make sense of this. At the very center of this diagram, you see husband, mm -hmm. you see wife, and you see Jesus. And you see what? A lock. Yes. What does that mean? Lock. Well, that, that's the sacred circle. That Sorry. represents the sacred circle. The husband and the wife, of course, Christ in the center of their marriage, their that's union. It. And nobody else is to penetrate or compromise that, that sacred circle. Later on, we are going to address even that inner circle with Christ, husband, and wife. But for now, leave it right there. Mm -hmm. Sacred circle. Which group is on the outside of that sacred circle with husband and wife? Well, firstly, we have the children. And they're not to? They're not to enter into that sacred no, circle. No, no. And we will address that. Next circle. Go ahead, Hitler. Next circle. Parents. Mm -hmm. Outside of parents, we have siblings. Correct. Then outside of siblings, we have church members. And then outside of the church members, we have friends. And one reason, primary reason, why many marriages uh, fall apart, the sacred circle has been broken. And we could have dealt with any intricate Issues that destroys marriage right now. But why this one first? Because when the priest left the labor, the first thing he does, he walks into the holy place, and what does he do with the curtain and that door? Closes Shuts it. Shuts it. It's time to close, seal that sacred circle. Amen. Makes sense? The marriage sacred circle. Look at the statement right here. Hillary, okay. page 337, Adventist Home. Oh, how many lives are made bitter by the breaking down of the walls which enclose the privacies mm. of every family right. and which are calculated to preserve its purity and sanctity. Mm. A third person is taken into the, into the confidence of the wife 
and her private family matters are laid open before the special friend. This, this is the device of Satan to estrange the hearts of the husband and wife. Oh, that this would cease. What a world of trouble would be saved. Hmm. Lock within. I like that word, right? Amen. Lock. It's time to close and seal the sacred circle. Lock within your, lock within your own hearts. The knowledge of each other's faults. Tell your troubles alone to God. He can give you right counsel and sure consolation, sure peace, which will be pure, having no bitterness in it. Amen. Next statement. When a woman relates her family troubles or complains of her husband to another man, she violates her marriage vows. She dishonors her husband and breaks down the wall erected to preserve the sanctity mm. of the marriage relation. She throws wide open the door and invites Satan to enter with his insidious temptations. Mm. So not only is this other man coming into that sacred circle, Correct. but who else are you inviting in? It says Satan enters in with his insidious temptations. Correct. Because many times when this woman, wife, goes and find a man in the church and begins to open up to this man her marital problems, what happens? Many times, all of a sudden now, this man in the church now commits, for, commits adultery with this wife or even marry her. Right. It, it has happened over and over again in various churches. Yes. The sacred circle has been, has been broken. broken. Read on. Uh, this this is, is just, just as Satan would have it. If a woman comes to a Christian brother with a tale of her woes, her disappointments and trials, he, he should ever advise her. If she must confide her troubles to someone, to select sisters for her confidants, and then there will be no appearance of evil whereby the cause of God may suffer reproach. And we have to be very consistent here. So now, does this mean that you, Hillary, must go and tell sisters in the church your marital problems? No, that's also breaching uh, the sacred circle. So notice the words in red. If she must confide her troubles to someone. Now, let's give a qualification. If, if a woman, or even a husband, if their lives are threatened right. by the other spouse, yes, they need help. Right. All Abuse. Right? Correct. Right. Besides that, and there might be another, besides that, notice now, if she must confide her troubles to someone, to select who now? Sisters for her confidence. But now, what must the sisters do? The only role of the third party is to say, all right, you have marital problems, Go talk to your husband and, and let, and both of you have to agree that you need a third party, objectively, spiritually, to help both of you. If your husband or wife refuse to come, I cannot help you. Hmm. Because we have to be consistent. Right. And sometimes this point, as the listener, sometimes it catches you off guard yes. because we naturally want to help someone. If a sister comes to me, I, I naturally want to help. And so a lot of times you're caught in a place because you want to sympathize and you want to, you know, Correct. offer godly advice. But again, you don't want to cause somebody to, you know, compromise that sacred circle. And many times what happens is this. When one spouse relates marital problems to an outsider, let's even, even if it is of the same gender, the persons who are listening have in their hearts hatred. They despise that spouse who is hurting their friend. And peradventure, the couple uh, gets back together, husband and wife reconcile, and they have moved on. That third party, that fourth party, still holds a grudge against that spouse. Right. That's why it's dangerous to break that sacred circle and relate your, your uh, issues that you have uh, with others to somebody else. I'm going to read you a statement here from the book Adventist Home, page 177. Adventist Home, page 177. I'm not sure if we read that quotation about the grave. 
Did we? Yes. All right. That the heart of the wife must be the grave for the fault of the husband. Right. And the heart of the husband must be the grave of the wise faults. Right. We cannot break that sacred circle. That's right. And as you mentioned that um, while the couple may have moved on and reconciled, the other person holds a grudge. But not only holding a grudge, but sometimes that other person loves to gossip. And so it doesn't stop. So even though you come to that person in confidence, hoping that they're a spiritual person to yeah. offer you godly advice, yeah. they go tailbearing and they're telling your personal issues Correct. to everybody. And Correct. now it's out in the open on the street. Correct. And that could Potent. even yes. that could even cause further. Once the couple says, OK, we're reconciled, but that could reopen up the mm. wounds. And how many how many couples have to stop going to some churches and stop going around other people? because of what was told about them to other people. And this thing spread all around. And even though they want to reconcile, and maybe they are in the process of reconciling, the guilt and the shame of what was exposed haunts them, haunts them along the way. Mm -hmm. That's why it's dangerous to expose the faults in your marriage to somebody else. Right, and also to listen to others who want to relate their faults to you. So as a listener, you Correct. have to be a spiritual person and you have to close that door, as it were. And say, the only way I can help you, even as a pastor, someone comes in the office, pastor, they call me pastor, you know, this is, I said, stop sister, stop brother. Are there marriage problems? Yes, all right, go to your spouse and say, we need counseling. And if both of you agree, then come see me. That's it. Right. You cannot come to me and say, let me uh, lay on you all the problems. I cannot help you. Why? I'm outside of God's way, outside of God's will. A third thing we must consider is how in marriages, how a spouse may say, I'm going to hang around this other person because this other person is my best friend. This is what destroys, again, friends, write these things down now, write them down, things that destroy the sacred circle. And it's time for us to be closing and sealing that sacred circle. Again, don't tell anybody else. But I've dealt with many individuals wherein in their marriages, this is the issue. One spouse, had this friend before the marriage. And this friend is your best friend. And the other spouse is saying, how do you talk to her so often? Why is she calling your phone? Why is she or she texting you? So are we talking about of the opposite gender it or does, the same gender? Okay, let's start somewhere. Where do you want to start? Either one. Okay, opposite, okay. opposite gender then. Okay. It's my best friend. Well, I think first And this of all, destroys, am I right or wrong? Right. It just, it, it's my best friend. Well, I think, first of all, when you make that covenant with a husband and a wife, mm -hmm. forsaking all others, I'm That's sorry, it. you may have been close, which I don't even know how close a male and a female should be without, you know, wanting to going down the path That's to be it. married. But anyway, you have to cut that off. You right. have to cut off those relationships as a married man or a married woman. You don't have friends of the opposite best gender, best friends or even I mean, I don't want to just sound cold, but you don't have friends of the opposite mm, gender period. that you talk to on the phone. What are you talking Text, about? That's it. You know, and outside of your husband or wife. Exactly. And on, on the individual level, from that perspective, when I come to Christ, who's my best friend? Christ. Who's my best friend? Christ. I'm married to Christ. He's my best friend. So now when I get married to you, who's my best friend, Hillary? I should, I am. <laughs> My best yes. friend. Amen. And that's so, why the so, state. So, so, mm -hmm. so, so now no one else I should call my best friend so that now I'm sharing family, marriage uh, issues and history events with somebody else. Mm -hmm. What am I doing? I am breaking the marriage sacred circle. Circle. Yes. Right. Um, I think I lost my trade of thought, <laughs> but right. it, it will come back. And to me. then what happens is, let's say one spouse feels uneasy with that, 
and the other spouse holds a hard end. No, he's my best friend. No, she's my best friend. You are too jealous. Ah, but remember now, we read a statement which says, the last sentence, Adventist home, page 177, paragraph 2, a strong ease, a black words. Mm -hmm. A strong sense of proprietorship should be felt, giving a sense of ease, restfulness, and trust. trust. That's right. it. Right. Nobody should make the husband or wife Get feel over suspicious. It. You know, you're too jealous. If, if one spouse doesn't feel comfortable with you and your quote-unquote best friend, for the sake of your marriage vows to your spouse in the sight of God, what must you do with that quote-unquote best friend? Cut it off. Hmm? Right. That's it. And that's why we that's read it. a statement earlier yes. that said the husband and the wife should be all to each other. That's they it. should be all to each other. So if you're receiving a fulfillment and you have a strong uh, communication and a strong relationship with your husband and husband or wife, you shouldn't be seeking outside uh, sources mm. to have that sense of fulfillment with, with friends, Correct. as it were. Now, what if that best friend, in quotes, best friend is of the same gender? How many times do you have uh, uh, either spouses, uh, uh, the man, the husband, he spends more time with male friends than with his wife? Well, that's a problem. And vice versa. And the, the, the spouse who is not that gu who's not guilty on that point feels, in, feels neglected. neglected. Mm -hmm. And instead of the, of the spouse who is guilty saying, Based on 1 Corinthians 13, love, right? Mm -hmm. Love is not selfish. Right. Seek not her oh. own. So I won't do what please me. I must do what please God. And in this marriage, I must make you feel a sense of trust, ease. Don't feel jealous on this point now. Make sense, my friends? Mm -hmm. Cut that relationship. Right. Don't spend so much time with your boys, with the girls. Mm -mm. Right. Even the world, many times before uh, two, two persons get married, they have what is called some party before the, the wedding. The bachelor party or bachelorette no, party. No. Right. And what do they say? Party. It's the last time with the boys, right? Yeah. Not so, because even after the marriage, they go right back with the boys and with the girls, right? And many times hanging out with the boys. The boys may have other girls hanging out, ladies now. And they're not studying and the Bible. see what happens? Right. Dangerous. Yeah, they're not studying that. And, and I wanted to bring out a point, too, because we were talking about relating marital issues, but it doesn't even have to be marital Correct. issues or problems that you're sharing that compromises the sacred circle. You could just be sharing information that nobody really needs to know, Correct. you know, Money matters, it right. could be budgeting, whatever, you know, family planning, whatever it may be. It doesn't have to be an issue, Correct. but there are certain family matters that you cannot share with other Correct. people Correct. because you open the door of that sacred, that sacred circle and you invite others in. Let's take a look at this um, chart right here. Look at that third circle outside, husband, wife, and then we have children. Who comes next? Parents. Parents. Parents, many times husband and wife allow parents to intrude and literally break down the lock of that marriage sacred circle. And the parents come in and they sympathize with their child, right, against the other spouse. Right. And it destroys the marriage. In what sense? Are we making sense up here? You sure? Parents. Right. Destroy marriage, how? Hmm? And how do they get too involved? Hmm? Try to raise your children, they said. That's yes. where I'm going again, Hillary. Yeah, they try to raise your children and give you advice that you didn't necessarily ask for, but as the parents, they feel that they have a certain privilege since, you know, we raised you and it, mommy and daddy always know best. So they think they have a right to intrude and advise you on right. um, financial matters, family, Diet. anything, you know, education of the children. Oh, why aren't they in this kind of school or exactly. that kind of school? Why are, are they eating know? this or eating that and watching this and going there? Make sense now? Right. And remember now, remember now, in the home, 
the 12 bread, loaves of bread, mm -hmm. in the home. Those bread, the word of God, is doctrine. How you live, right? How you live. But, but father and mother can come in and try to disrupt the law that the husband and the wife wrote and signed that will govern their home. Since husband and wife say by this rule we shall live, who alone can change it? Right. The husband and the wife. Right. Nobody on the outside should come in and say, this is how you do right. things. They don't have a say so. Even if the person on the outside is right, the husband and the wife must take what they're saying and go into prayer and God's Over word bread. and say, we want to see this for ourselves mm -hmm. and make that decision by ourselves, not allowing an intruder because you don't know where that will end. Right. And this will, this will indeed destroy marriages. Right. And sometimes, um, like you said, the parents do intrude. They think they've been given that privilege or that right. Correct. But a lot of times the, um, the son or the daughter, husband or wife, they invite the mm. parents into the sacred circle. So it's not always they trying to have a say-so over the family, but you know, you may just call your dad and mom and you just, or relate to them. Everything, volunteer information. Everything, you know, because a lot of times ad as adult children, we're close to our parents, mm -hmm. you know, and we figure they've been through this walk before, so maybe they can offer me some advice. Well, what do you do in this situation? Or this is going on in my household, not realizing that they are unlocking, unsealing that sacred circle. No, so what if, what if, let's say the wife, what if she's going through something and she knows only mom can help me through this, right? And it is very uh, an intimate, personal. personal issue, right? What should she do as the wife? Well, she should firstly take it to God in prayer mm -hmm. and ask him, you know, what she should do. If she doesn't get clear direction there from God and his word, Correct. then go to the husband. Mm -hmm. Hopefully he's spiritual because you're walking through the sanctuary. Correct. So. Go to the husband and see what he thinks. If it's something like a female issue, it's, right. you know, that maybe the husband won't understand, ask the husband, well, I'm thinking about sharing this with, with my mother. I Correct. think she can help me, you know, as I navigate through this stage in my life. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Now, what if he says, sure, go ahead and seek mom's counsel. Green light, right? You go on that issue. But what if he says no? What happens now? Yeah, you, you, you cannot break that. Hmm? Exactly. So what do you do now? You go back on your knees mm -hmm. and you say, Lord, I strongly believe for the context, mom has the answer, but my husband, the two become one, he's saying no, right? Lord, if it's your will, change, change his heart. Work out the circumstances mm -hmm. and God can do it. If you remember, with Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, did Sarah not instruct Abraham to break that sacred circle? Yes. Did he not? Yes. And what was the end result? Misery. And notice, afterward, when Hagar had Ishmael, right? How was Hagar treating Sarah? Mistreating her, disrespectful. Mm. And what did Sarah her. say to Abraham to do with Hagar? To send her away. And but what did Abraham say? No, no. But what did God do? God, God came intervened. in and spoke to Abraham. Let the, let the bond woman and the son, and son go. go. Make sense now? Mm -hmm. So if the husband say, I don't see light in that. To have peace in the home, you don't go do it behind his back. Regardless, you go on what? On your knees. knees. And go back to the word. And say, Lord, I believe it's your way, but God's way may be right, but is, is it God's time? Mm -hmm. Make sense now? Yes. Let's go down to, back to the circle and talk about even children. Sacred circle. Children. Mm -hmm. How do husband and wife allow children to come in and break and destroy that sacred circle? Well, sometimes they do it knowingly. A mm. lot of times, especially if the children are older, if there's issues in the marriage, perhaps, you know, maybe they see the child as a friend and not mm. their, their child. And so now mother or father begins to relate 
marital issues to the child. Yeah, or, or she's walking around grumpy or he's walking around grumpy and the child, oh, what's wrong? Oh, well, and they start to share what the other spouse is doing. And not only does that hurt, breach the sacred circle, but it also causes that child to lose respect for, mm. well, for both parents. Correct. One, for the parent that's being talked about, but also for you for sharing, you know, with him intimate things mm. that a child should not even know. I don't even care if they're a grown child, mm. you know. How many of you know of husband and wives who, who, just to get back to the other spouse, meaning to retaliate negatively, they try to pull that child in closer and speak words of evil about the other parent to get that child on his or her side, right? right? Or they bribe the child with material things to do that. Mm -hmm. What are they doing with the circle? They're breaching the sacred circle. Sacred circle. And that's knowingly, but sometimes um, carelessly or neglectfully it happens. Ignorantly. You know, parents are, are yes. talking or whatever. Maybe they're talking loud in the house and the child is around or they think the child is in his room Correct. doing something by mm -mm, himself and they're having a personal intimate conversation and that child's ears are listening to every word that they say. He's in the sacred circle. That's that it. should not be. Back to the screen. Notice again. And before I go here, let's also remember that children, if they don't see love between husband and wife, they will never grow to respect and love their parents. So what happens is, as this spouse is trying to negatively retaliate toward the other spouse by bringing this child on his side, her side, that spouse is destroying not only the family, the marriage, but the home. Right. And peradventure, husband and wife reconcile that seed that was sown in the heart of your son, in the heart of your daughter, that, that terrible seed against daddy, against mommy, is very difficult to uproot it. Right. Very difficult. And they will live with that negative seed in their minds toward husband, toward father, toward mother. And it's Dangerous. A, it's a possibility that if Christ doesn't come, they will perpetuate it in their own relationships. Mm -hmm. When they grow older, they'll begin to disrespect their spouse as well or to live the way that they saw their parents living as well. Now, how about this one? <clears throat> because, again, we have done marital counseling with individuals, and we have heard this one, wherein one spouse wants family members to come and live in the house with them. And the family members are able-bodied, and really they want to take uh, advantage of the situation, right? And one spouse is saying, no, they cannot come here. And the other says, but I want them to come. Have you ever seen that before? It destroys marriage. Why? Because now they, one spouse may have the family members or friends come over to live mm -hmm. for an extended period of time, right? And this drives a wedge between the husband and the wife. Right. And not only that, sometimes compromises are made when these family members come in. You know, Correct. let's say they're not even Sabbath keepers. So they want to bring meat in the house and just to appease them, break maybe the one of the, or break the Sabbath or play certain music or bring their video game or whatever the case may be. So the sacred circle, the whole constitution of the household is falling apart. Mm -hmm. And so what would be the solution again now? But what if the friend or family member use sympathy? Or coercion, you know, that's my son, or that's my nephew, you know, that's my niece. And they use uh, sympathy or even persuasion. I think principle, Bible principle. So what principle. do we do? What should husband and wife do when faced with that situation? Well, they go to their knees, they pray about it, they see what the Word of God says, and then they come to, a, hopefully, They'll both see eye to eye on so, whether or not to bring that person into the home. Now, what if one say, I want them to come, and the other spouse say, no. What it, happens now? It, it's a no. What happens? As long as it is not a life and death situation, it's a what? It's a no. Maybe if they're dying, let them die, right? Hmm? But again, there must be union. <laughs> Unity among 
husband and wife. Have to be. Mm -hmm. If you are the spouse who sees light for them to come over and tarry for a number of weeks, months, then go on your knees and say, Lord, work it out. Show my other spouse that this is the right thing. And if you believe that God can work miracles, what must you have? Patience. Right. And faith. And wait, that's yeah, it. You have that's to. Right. You have to. Because you see, many times as an individual, does God allow crisis and crises to come upon the individual for them to exercise faith? Oh, absolutely. And to develop patience. Right. So in the marriage council, That's the right. marriage council, God allows trials, tests for that spouse who say, I want them to come to go on his or her knees and say, dear God, I'm going to exercise faith. Give me patience. You work it out and watch God work. Right. Well, another um, scenario that coincides with the one you just brought out about uh, people, relatives or friends needing to stay in the house or asking to stay in the house. What about people just coming to visit? You know, not long term, but uh, well, so-and-so wants to come over Correct. and visit. So that's another issue that needs to be worked out together jointly. Husband there has to be a joint, a mutual uh, agreement. But I think here we need to address a question that how do we know, because somebody watching this broadcast may be saying, well, then what can I share? You know, how do I know if I'm breaching that sacred circle? What if I'm just talking to my sister, you know, or somebody in the church and we're just talking? How do I know what to share from what not to share? Well, I mean, the point goes, anything that has to deal with the marriage, they cannot come in. If they have to come in, it must be a mutual agreement by husband and wife to allow John Brown or Mary Smith to come on in. It has to be a mutual agreement, period, right? Okay. That door must be closed. And if one party feels otherwise, that party cannot make his, his or her decision, regardless of the other person's feelings and thoughts, or else you are breaching the marriage vow. You are putting somebody else above your husband's, wife's thoughts and feelings. Work it out together. Then, as having a united front, then you can address what's coming your way. What about husbands or wives who hold secrets from their spouse? Well, we read that this, this shouldn't be so, you, you know. I was doing a counseling, don't have to call names, but uh, the wife was saying, even her husband, in the meeting, he was there, that when he takes a shower, he takes a shower and bring his phone, his cell phone in the shower with him. Lock the door, bring his wallet in the shower and lock the door. And he's always on the phone. If she comes in the room, he's off the phone. Well, he's put her out of the sacred circle, I guess, and somebody else is in that, or he's in a sacred circle with his phone and whoever else is on that phone. Right? Mm -hmm. If she, she, she has no access to his email, I mean, live crises in marriages. He doesn't want to give her access to certain things. What's happening here? No trust. Mm -hmm. Secrecy, secrets are being held with one spouse against the other spouse. Right. And this cannot be healthy in a marriage. So what happens here now, the least sign the other spouse see that may appear to be infidelity, that spouse uses that as a sign the other spouse is cheating, disloyal mm -hmm. to the marriage. And what happens here is if those two really want to have reconciliation, a change has to be made. Like in our home, everything is open, right? Emails, everything, bank account, everything. Right. Phone. Yeah. I mean, if Hillary takes my phone, I don't come and say, why do you have my phone? I grab up my phone. Why? Right. And, there and you have some really husbands who don't want their wives to even see their phone, much more touch the phone. And I then the question why. is, you know, why? And the, hold on. And the wife now mm -hmm. has to call um, Verizon or <laughs> who do you have? Sprint and T-Mobile <laughs> and say, may I have the record, the phone records of this number? Well, ma'am, you are not 
an authorized, authorized user. user. <laughs> Right? Yeah, yeah. Right? Or if she, if she wants was and get access, now she's wondering, who are these numbers being called at this time of the day? Make sense now? Right. So that's why these are the things that must be dealt with. Foot washing. Let's wash out because many people now are guilty of these things. Right. Watching right now. Guilty. It's time for the ordinance of humility. Wash right. away these things. And I, I do believe that if, if it's a healthy relationship, Correct. then maybe the wife or the husband wouldn't be asking to see the phone. <laughs> you know, why are you, I mean, why do you need to see the phone? But then if somebody is acting secretively Correct. with Correct. the phone, you know, and just can't get rid of it, is always on it, always looking down and so on and so forth, then you could see why the question was asked. But if, if the relationship is open and the communication is open, I don't think there should be suspicion where they're looking behind each other's back. It's already open. They share, they may have to share email accounts or what have you. And also um, secret transactions, as you mentioned Correct. too, you know, can't see the bank account. Some people may be undercover shopaholics and so Ooh. they have extra credit cards or, or, or whatever, debit cards, open up this account that the spouse doesn't even know about. And, you know, on the side, they're, you know, purchasing things secretively. That, that's not healthy. Correct. Now, write down these last four things we're going to lay out before you. Number one, one way to keep that sacred circle intact or a theme, closing and sealing the sacred circle. Number one, last four points. Number one, be careful how you... Uh, Receive prayer requests. Hmm. And give prayer and requests. Give prayer requests. The enemy is, is a cunning devil. Make sense now? Oh, just pray for my husband because A, B, C, X, Y, Z, the whole list. What are you doing? Under the guise of prayer, pray for my husband, pray for my wife. What are you doing? You are breaking the sacred breaking circle. Breaking the sacred circle. Mm -hmm. Number two. Number two. If your husband sees you as a wife speaking to somebody in the church, on the job, wherever, frequently, and he may say, I don't trust that person. Watch out. What must you do? Do you know that many times a wife, husbands, listen up, many times your wife, can discern a woman flirting intuition with you and you don't see it or vice versa a man a husband wives can see that woman is flirting with you but you're ignorant of it so what must you say you're too jealous be quiet is that how you must respond no first corinthians 13, 13. you must take it seriously it. anything that makes your spouse feel uncomfortable for God's sake and That's for it. their sake and That's for the it. marriage's sake, That's you it. have to take that and you have to have to believe that. And that brings up the Correct. point of yes. familiarity with Correct. the opposite gender Correct. as Correct. well. You now, have to be careful now, with aren't that. Aren't there some cases where that's just not the case? The spouse is just overly jealous, right? But for, I believe, 9 to 9.99% of the times, that other person is flirting and that spouse picks it up, even if she's wrong. Right. Or his observation is wrong for peace and love and harmony in the home. What must you do? Stay clear. Right? Right. Number three. Well, you don't be flirtatious either, exactly. just to throw that in. Yes, because exactly. some people may be that way, but they right. say, oh, I'm just friendly. I'm always, this is just my personality. Be, I mean, take that to God in prayer. He can put away those old habits Correct. and make you into a new creature. And number three, be very careful when an elder, a third party, especially if that person is of the opposite gender, want to give you individualized marriage counseling. Because that or person... Or Bible study. Or Bible study. <laughs> oh, oh, Hillary. Bible study, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> now, I want my wife, by God's grace, let's be prayer partners. <laughs> Good prayer partners, man. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for that one. Let's be prayer partners. Bible study. Or I want Bible study. So you're married, right? And all of a sudden now, you know, you want to give Bible study to somebody of the opposite gender. Or even vice no, versa, no. right? 
or this elder or pastor wants to give you individualized marriage counseling. My friends, it's happening right now. That elder, that pastor may say, you and your spouse do not need to be together. All of a sudden, he now marries that person, the pastor, the elder, now marries the person who was either going to be married or was married or even commit fornication. Be very, very careful. Be sober and be what? Be vigilant. Number four, yes? Number four, number four. Another subtle way how Satan destroys the sacred circle is with social media. Amen. Be careful how much you share of yourself and your family on social media. Remember now, when the priest walks from the laver out of court and goes into that holy place, the tent area, the curtain is shut. Drawn. And social media may be the very tool the enemy used to open that door. That's true. And you're po am I lying? No. And you're posting this. You're this posting is what that. we ate for breakfast. This is what we had for lunch. This is what we had for dinner. This is, um, you know, they just share right. everything. And uh, a person who is unconverted can see a weakness in you or in your marriage, right? And then exploit that weakness. And all of a sudden now, you and this person is in intimate communication via the phone, email, texting, and all of a sudden, you have broken not only the sacred circle, but also the marriage the seventh, vows, the seventh and commandment. all of it, my friend. Be right, very careful. And akin to that one, Hillary, is what I'm now hearing and seeing how some wives, are, most of the wives, are going to gyms. Well, husbands are doing it too. Mm, um, and then wives, going to gyms. <laughs> and they want to have a personal... A personal, a personal trainer. trainer. And that man, the personal trainer, he now wants to teach the wife how to stretch. What? Let me show you how to stretch and how to do this and that. All of a sudden, friends, it turns into something else. Right. And <clears throat> akin to that point, also as Dangerous. far as people, you know, exercising and wanting to capture their journey, because this is a big thing that you see now Let's on be social exercise media. Exercise partners. Right. Yes. So people are saying, okay, this is where I am day one. Mm. This is where I am week, well, not day one. Okay, week one, week two, week three. And they're sharing these photographs of themselves, naked pictures of themselves. And that brings up a, a, an interesting point that many times there are um, nonverbal ways because we took most of the I'm things. I'm available. I'm yeah, looking. Most of, the, most of the things that we shared are how the sacred circle can be compromised by what we share verbally. Things coming in. Right, things coming in. But also, there are nonverbal ways. And through dress, there is, individuals are showing uh, what only the husband or the wife should see when you're not a dress reformer. So, Correct. yes, Correct. they're showing their progress Correct. in exercise, mm. but just bigger than that or more general than that, I would say, when you're not covering yourself on a daily basis, you are exposing the sacred circle. Exactly. Only your husband should know the outline of your body. You should not be wearing tight clothes. You, you know, you should not be wearing, um, yes. even women wearing pants. A lot of Correct. people say, well, Correct. they have female pants. That shows the outline of your body. Correct. You should not be, Correct. and then some people say, well, the circumstance determines. So if I'm exercising, since you brought up that point, if I'm exercising, that gives me a right somehow to wear this. No, there's never a time when anybody outside of your husband or wife should see your body. Men too, because men are going to the gym and they're posting pictures of themselves with their chest open, their biceps, their legs, all of these things. No, that, that is the sacred correct. circle. And You're letting people correct. see what only your wife should see, what only your husband should see. And we go back to the sanctuary as a principle. Once the priest walked into the holy place, the curtain was? Was drawn. It was closed. It. Close curtain. Close curtain. Right. Amen. Amen. Nobody can see in. And what your spouse sees of you in that, Hillary, that means even the bedroom, that bedroom must be a sacred circle. Circle. And hmm. even, Make yes. sense now? Yeah. Right? And what we see and experience in that bedroom should not be on social media. Should not be in Gold's Gym. What's the next gym called? Uh, Planet Fitness. Planet Fitness, etc. 
I, I Iron Core. core. <laughs> no, 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 it's serious. It's serious. Very serious now, right? Yes. It's another way of destroying that sacred circle. That's right. And let me say this in closing on the dress part, because yes. we could say so much more. Correct. And, but, and we will get to that. Yes. And as you mentioned, the home, even children, because some people think, and women have asked me this about dress reform, well, is it okay for me if I'm just in my home to wear pants, for example, or to wear sleeveless or short sleeves or whatever? Mm. And you have children, children in the home. Correct. No, because then you have your little daughter that sees you wearing sweatpants or whatever, or you're showing your arm, your extremities, correct, basically. Correct. And then they begin to want to wear these things mm -hmm. in the home and outside of the home. They should not see your body. Even, even, even the if, you have, if you have a son in the home. Right, correct. even a son in the home. That's a part of the sacred circle, so you need to be clothed. Amen. Okay. Let's close right here. Go to Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24, and here's where I leave the husband and the wife. There are 12 loaves of bread on this table, right? The Word of God, good for doctrine, mm -hmm. reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, righteousness, that you all may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good, all good works. works. We have covered the, the first step, that is closing, and sealing the what, Hillary? The sacred circle. Sacred circle. More could be said. We, we must stop here. Here is where we close now. On that table with those loaves, something is placed there. And it's frank incense. F verse 7 of Leviticus 24. Frank incense. Frank incense. Put down Psalm 141 and verse 2. And Psalm 141 verse 2 says, Let my prayer... As sent unto thee as incense. So once you are going through the word, the bread, right? You're seeing doctrine, mm -hmm. right? You're seeing and you have received reproof. Mm -hmm. What must you do? Pray. Amen. You're being corrected. What must you do? Pray. Make sense now? Yes. You are being instructed in what is right. Bring it to God in Pray. prayer. And we tell the husband and tell the wife, these notes you receive today now, go back home, do your homework, and we will return within three days. Because after three days is corruption hmm. based wow. on scripture. So once we begin the marriage counseling, we don't allow too many days to elapse between sessions. All right? Go back over your notes. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians 13, from the gate to the table of showbread. To the laver all the way in mm -hmm. to the table of showbread. And then we will resume and dig some more. Amen? Get into the next loaf of bread. That's it. Shall mm -hmm. we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you this evening for what we have covered. Your word is quick, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, we have received today doctrine. We have received today reproof. We have received today correction. Yea, instruction in righteousness. That the man of God, the couple, the married couple, may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Mm -hmm. Keep the husbands, the wives, they, 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 the marriages intact, being reconciled until we return. It is the work of a lifetime. From this school, we will never graduate. It's time that we must be found closing and sealing the sacred circle that we can be closed with you and be sealed when you return. Save us, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, friends, we will resume on next Thursday by God's grace.